Hi everybody, Jacob here. Welcome back to the Fashion Bunker. We're talking Chanel Metier 2024. Uh, 2025 collection from Manchester, Paris, Manchester, uh, just hit the runways. And as the show was happening and Virginie Via had a huge success, you know, uh, stellar reviews, Bruno Pavlovsky, you know, the head of Chanel, well, one of them, actually not the main head anymore. But anyway, he gave an interview about Chanel and what's going on with the state of luxury today, what's going on with the state of Chanel today with the Metier Da collections and again, we have to read between the lines here, what he says and what he doesn't say. It's a very interesting review. So let's get to it. First, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already here on the tubes. You can push the join button next to the subscription button. Become a member today, get access to extra perks. You can also join me on Patreon. Super Deco all spelled together there as well for extra perks. Thank you to my members and patrons who have already pledged. This video is being filmed live in front of a live virtual audience. I live stream several times a week. So come join the live streams. Thumb up this video. And everything I say in this video is for entertainment purposes only, not rooted in truths or facts. Everything's alleged and just my opinion. Fashionnetwork.com uh, issues a uh, interview with Godfrey Dini and Bruno Pavlovsky entitled A Bullish Bruno Pavlovsky on a beautiful 2023 taking Chanel to Manchester and maintaining Metieda. Now, why are, okay, so there's a whole introduction. I'm not going to go through all the introduction of the show. Um, privately owned Chanel does not break out its sales figures because they're privately owned. They don't, they don't owe anybody any, you know, answers about how much money they earn. They decide when to disclose it and when not to. But privately owned Chanel does not break out its sales figures but annual revenues are approaching 20 billion euro. Bear that in mind. They are so rich. So, the magazine sat down with Bruno Pavlovsky at the Bay Horse Tavern on Thomas Street to do an interview. Fashion Network asks, why are we in Manchester? Bruno Pavlovsky answers, Virginie really want... Should I read this in his French accent? Because he has a terrible English. <laughs> Allegedly. Uh, Virginie really wanted uh, to uh, come to England for many reasons. Culture, music, uh, and inspiration. But uh, n not go to London as we have done that uh, enough. We wanted a city that uh, represents uh, England, its energy, music, and ideas mixed up with creativity. So here we are in Manchester. Okay, I'm going to read now normally because we'll go, we'll go. To my mind, there is a discrepancy between how many people see Chanel and the way it is perceived in a dynamic city like Manchester, a birthplace of the Industrial Revolution, blessed with beautiful energy. This is his kind of marketing side, PR side, trying to tell a story. Because you remember, guys, a couple of months ago or years ago, he said, you know, one of the strengths of Chanel is that they continue very strong storytelling with every collection that is presented and shown. He's like, the biggest sales point is the solid storytelling. You remember when the 22 bags were first launched in 1922? 1922? In 2022, they had these chapters, like different cities of the world, actually different cities in America, and different actresses, you know, young, up-and-coming, well, already famous actresses, depicting a different scenario, one in Arizona, I think, or one in L.A., one in New York, and they were telling their story, living the life with their 22 Chanel bag. You know, there was very solid storytelling. So now he's building and weaving already the texture to tell us, look, there's a reason why we're in Manchester. There's a story we want to tell. You see, that's what he's doing here. Then he said, Virginie wanted to look for inspiration and connect to the modern energy, art scene and music here. And Thomas Street incarnated part of that history. It's a cotton street, once famed for its fabrics, and today fashion shops, pubs, and tattoo bars. 
So he now set the tone. He said to us, we know what we're doing. We went back to Manchester to this particular street that is famous for its fabric. And of course, Chanel does fabric and they click, you know, there you go. Um, Fashion Network asks, why is it important that the Métier da shows travel so much? And he says, well, we could easily remain in France, but we like to follow the ideas of Virginie. And this season, it's Manchester. Last year, she wanted... <laughs> I love how he's like, last year, she wanted to go to Africa. And after considering that, we realized the car was the right choice. So we let her do it. Now, I added that. He didn't say, so we let her do it. But it kind of comes off as like, she wanted to go to Africa. And we were like, why? But then we did it anyway, because whatever. <laughs> That's how it sounds to me. And um, it's important to travel in general. Even if we have seen some great Métier da shows in Paris, travel makes you breathe in another culture, like in Dakar or, Man or Manchester, which is great for a French brand like Chanel. Not really, because Coco Chanel never liked to travel. She never went to Asia, to India. She hated that she had to go to America like four times or what, how many ever times she went. Uh, so this is not at all in, in Chanel's blood, really. Not to say that she wasn't fascinated by faraway lands. She was, but she never really wanted to go there. And when asked, oh, are you ever going to go to Asia? She's like, why? I, I have so much still to see here. I, I haven't seen literally anything in Europe. I don't have the time, you know. <laughs> Let me like expand in my home and then let's move elsewhere was her kind of motto, allegedly. Um... The discovery of many layers in a city and culture, what Manchester means and stands for, and an expo in Victoria Baths that shows why should I, blah, blah, blah. And they talk about the expo, not interesting. And, uh, oh, then they poke at him. How was the approach varied from Carl to Virginie? Now they want to know from him what's different between the two. And Bruno says, to my mind, Carl and Virginie are very different. Virginie tries to choose a new screen for each collaboration, even as her ideas nurture and nourish the codes of the brand. I should also say there have never been so many clients coming into our boutique. He's saying that she's better than Carl. In a very subtle way. Or is he lying just to kind of keep face? Thumb up the video and subscribe while you're at it. If you're enjoying this, thumb up the video. It means the world to me and it also helps out the channel. And follow me on Instagram, DacobCC, all spelled together for more Chanel insights. Not because her ideas and designs are simpler. Oh, sorry. That's another one. Virginie is bringing her own touch to each collection freer and more fluid even if i don't really like to compare her and carl he literally said she's selling more than him he's literally saying she's more free and more fluid than he was he was more rigid he, that's what he implies the shade he's throwing at carl and yet he was totally fine with carl all those decades wasn't he oh this guy mm, bruno 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 dangerous very dangerous imagine if he's still with us after virginie leaves and somebody else comes what is he going to say how better they are than her oh the snakery has the age of your clients become younger with virginie oh there oh child this is so juicy love the questions so they ask has the age of your clients become younger with virginie my answer personally is like everything costs like 10 times more now <laughs> i think the clientele got older and if younger then they have to be very rich but anyway bruno says i don't like to reduce the discussion to that this is his way of saying 
I feel uncomfortable talking about this because he doesn't want to really address the situation, right? We have a very wide range of clients. Even if we find in all cases there is a younger clientele coming into our boutiques and discovering the brand. Notice how he never says buying. He says they come in they to look, they're interested. But he, he's not saying they can afford it. He's not saying they can buy it. He's not saying that they do buy it. He says they look. <laughs> not because her ideas, and th this is... And he says, not because her ideas and designs are simpler. Often they want what's more sophisticated. So I never really look at the idea of age. I think it blocks your view. Chanel is a very large idea in terms of style, silhouette, and expression. I think he lost himself here because it doesn't make much sense what he's saying. I don't like to reduce the discussion to the age, we have a very wide range of clients, even if we find in all cases there is a younger clientele coming into our boutiques and discovering the brand, full stop. Not because her ideas and designs are simpler, often they want what's more sophisticated. So I never really look at the idea of age. So what is he saying? That the younger audience wants something more sophisticated, Virginie delivers simplicity. Yeah, he, very shady answer. Then they ask, what were the first two companies acquired by Perfection and why? Perfection is a subsidiary kind of part of Chanel, and then they buy all the métier d'art uh, companies, you know, to do the buttons, to do the feathers, to do the tweeds, to, to do the metals. So anyway, he says, Desrue euh, for the buttons and Lesage for embroidery. And then they go on this conversation about purchasing, you know, because it is a Métier d'art collection after all, so purchasing all of these brands. Uh, not so interesting. What sort of year is Chanel having? This is interesting. Bruno says 2023 will be a beautiful year, double digit growth. He can say whatever he wants, by the way because they are not on the stock market. It's a privately owned company. They don't owe anybody any explanation, right? He can say triple digit growth if he wants to. You know what I mean? So, but let's, we believe him. He says double digit growth, okay. But the bigger question is that since September, we are still growing steadily, even as major economies are slowing down. During COVID, Chanel clients could not spend money especially for travel, but they have since returned to our boutiques in large numbers. Which is also bizarre because during the lockdown, people were buying a lot of Chanel, me included. So I don't know why he's saying that um, things have changed. I don't know. Interesting. He's kind of saying the opposite here. 2024 will be calmer. So he's telling us now they're going to make less money next year. There will be a slowdown, but I stress not a fall. But overall, the perspectives for luxury are still very good. I see a future where lots of entrepreneurs will make a lot of money and they will want to spend it. The fracture in society between very rich and the mass of people will continue. And those at the top will naturally turn to top quality products with a real history. This is a disgusting part, in my opinion, of, the, of, of what he has to say. Because first he's saying, I see a future where lots of entrepreneurs will make a lot of money and they will want to spend it. So he's talking about the nouveau riche. Okay, Nouveau Riche does not a classic brand make, Bruno. If that's all you want to nurture the Nouveau Riche, good luck to you and the trash you're going to be selling them. And then he says the fracture in society between very rich and the mass of people will continue. You see how when you talk luxury, we've already seen it when uh, luxury brands talk about the aspirational client, what they mean is the poor client who can't afford substantial pieces from the brand, so they buy a lipstick, entry-level, price tag, uh, small leather good, you know, poverty. But they don't say poverty, they say aspirational. Here, 
he's talking about this. He's saying the fracture in society between very rich and what's the opposite of very rich? Very poor. He does not use the word poor. He says, but he does use the word rich because that goes well with luxury, especially very rich, which is what he says. The fracture in society between very rich and then he says, and the mass of people. So he's, his definition, his elitist definition of society is the very rich versus the mass of people. That's it. That's his separation. So you're either very rich or you belong to the mass of people. There is no you know, mid-class society, bourgeoisie, nothing. There's the very rich, not even rich, very rich and mass of people. And the mass of people is poverty, but he's not going to say the word. He's not. It doesn't exist. He's avoiding it like the total snob that he is. You know, doesn't... Poor? What's that? I don't know her. The fracture in society between very rich and the mass of people will continue. And then his elitism is even more disgusting. Don't forget, Coco Chanel always said, the opposite of luxury is not poverty. The opposite of luxury is vulgarity. And my dear Bruno... You're being very vulgar here in this interview, in my humble opinion. Not Chanel at all. Sorry, boo-boo. So he goes on to say, The fracture in society between very rich and the mass of people will continue. And those at the top, and those at the top, the phrasing, and those at the top, will naturally, he says, turn to top quality products with a real history. Except your leather peels, allegedly. So those at the top are going to turn to top quality? So are you telling us they're going to go to Hermès instead of Chanel? Is that what you're implying here, Bruno? With real history, he says. Hmm. I mean, Virginie is delivering more Chanel history than Carl did, so I can hand him that. Plus, the great force of Chanel is that we also have a very wide base in perfume. Here he now touches base on where the money is really coming from. The aspirational client. The person that doesn't have the money to buy the big ticket items. But he's not saying it. He's not calling it out for what it is. He's not calling a spade a spade. Instead, he's weaving it in saying, plus, the great, plus, the great force, great force of Chanel is that we also have a very wide base in perfume, cosmetics, accessories, and shoes. And we want to maintain that even if that's Tricky now. Why would he say that is tricky? Think about it. Why would it be tricky to maintain a very wide base in perfume, cosmetics, accessories, and shoes? Why is that tricky to maintain? I think it's tricky to maintain because they're pricing themselves so high that that aspirational customer now can barely even afford their perfumes and cosmetics and shoes. So he's talking about maintaining the client because he can have his very, very, very rich who buy the clothing, they're not many people, right? But he needs many people to buy these other products to bring in money constantly. But it's becoming more difficult to maintain that 
So he says, we want to maintain that even if that's tricky now. How interesting and vague he formulates all of this. And yet we have to read between the lines. And then they ask him, what are you planning in terms of store openings? And then he says, we are continually augmenting the quality and pertinence of our network in over 50 countries to create the best possible shopping experience. We might open one or two flagships per year, but not much more. In Shanghai, for example, we have three boutiques, while other competitors have far more. He's showing off here. He's saying competitors, they need to open 10 boutiques per city. We open three because, you know, we're Chanel, honey. Oh, he is a piece of work. Let me tell you, in Paris or in Hong Kong, it's more about the idea of improving our importance in each town. The simple fact is we need larger boutiques. If before our stores were between 500 and 600 square meters, now we need twice that size. And that is easier in Asia as malls are getting bigger. Whereas on Avenue Montaigne and Rue Cambon, it is far harder to do. I'll, I'll give him that. We also have Chanel et moi. I cannot believe he tried to weave Chanel et moi, the Chanel and me service, you know, for their repairs and like their five-year warranty on their bags and wallets on chain. Everybody that I have ever talked to who owns a Chanel bag or wallet on chain and had issues with them, quality issues with them, not one single person that I've spoken to that had these issues with their product and used the uh, Chanel et moi services was happy with them. Nobody was happy with the service. It's like a service that they say they have. But you, they don't do anything for you. They tell you, oh, this is normal wear and tear. Sorry, this is like not covered by our warranty. It's like nothing. It's like non-existent. I can't believe he's actually priding himself of this. And he says, we also have Chanel et moi, a service program that was in existence before, but is now more visible. Like when a client brings us a product that has a problem and we render that easier, with a 40 square meter space in each boutique for diagnostic discussion, discreet, calm, and intimate, since stores are often very busy. Well, if I don't live and breathe, <laughs> Bruno, 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 I've never seen this before. I don't know which boutiques are opening up this discreet and intimate 40 square meter appraisal of the problem that a product can have. But girl, I come to, this, to the boutique, bring my peeling Chanel leather bag. They, the sales associate looks at it in no intimate scenario, honey. In the middle of the sales floor, they're like, oh, let me see. Ah, this is not a big deal. Or let me see, oh, do you really want us to send it? And it's going to take about six months for it to come back. I mean, Bruno, come on, girl. Come on. You can do Zubera, Zubera, Zubera. Then they say, they ask, on the web, Chanel only sells scents and cosmetics. That's not true. They also sell eyewear, but whatever. Why not at least accessories? No, they do sell accessories. Eyewear is accessories. So the interviewer was not very informed. But Bruno says, why change? Yes, e-commerce is great, but your client is already connected to our boutiques. The web cannot offer a beautiful experience, except maybe, yes, for scent and cosmetics. I feel our clients are attached to our boutiques and that relationship to discover beautiful products with first-rate service. First-rate service? You gotta be very lucky nowadays to get first-rate service from Chanel, in my humble opinion. Allegedly. That relationship is central, and I think about it all the time. Oh, you think about it all the time, Bruno? Bless your heart. You think about, you think about the first rate service all the time. You think about it. Hey, here's a tip for you, Bruno. Why don't you, instead of just thinking about it all the time, how about you actually start 
implementing it all the time in all your boutiques. We'll go, we'll go. Question, what are the secrets to guaranteeing Chanel remains a successful luxury fashion brand? His answer, investing in products and savoir-faire, know-how, and the best raw materials, <laughs> mm. and nourishing creativity and inspiration, and always offering products that have real value. That is my priority. Ah. <sighs> Question. Many of your campaigns are shot by Ines and Vinu. Uh, why is there such a strong affinity for their work? Uh, answer. Uh, they have a great complicity with Virginie. They understand what she wants and her ideas. Plus, they have great talent and they get what she wants in terms of projecting her image of Chanel. So, anywho, um, that was the interview. You know, there's parts that I didn't read to you. You can check out the article. It's interesting. But these are kind of the highlights. And, and, and this made me think, isn't it interesting how Chanel relies on Kristen Stewart? They used to rely on Pharrell. Finally got rid of him. Now Louis Vuitton has to deal with him. <laughs> uh, Margot Robbie, all these famous faces, famous faces, you know. And all of these brands rely on famous faces, except one of these high-end luxury brands. One doesn't rely on famous faces. Hermès. Hermès does not hire actresses, actors. They don't. They, they just don't. It's a very interesting strategy because... Also, if one of these actors or actresses falls out of favor, is in a scandal, could tarnish the brand in some ways, that doesn't happen to Hermès. Hermès sells itself. Very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. I love that Hermès, they're like, we rely on ourselves, honey. But Bruno apparently relies on dreams. <laughs> he thinks about them all the time. He thinks about these good things all the time. He thinks about the good quality materials. He always thinks about good service. It's on his mind all the time, the good service in boutiques, the good quality materials. I'm so happy it's always on his mind. That really helps us, all of us customers knowing that Bruno has these thoughts on his mind all the time. Notice how he never says that he implements those thoughts into actual practice, but they're on his mind. In other words, he's plugged into his mind and he is thinking <laughs> about this all the time. Good for you, Bruno. I love a man who thinks. Well, me thinks this topic is exhausted by now. So uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. Thumb it up if you have. Uh, follow me on Instagram, DacobCC. Subscribe to my channel here. Amy says in the chats, their raw materials suck. They don't have luxurious return policies. They treat you like crap when luxury and class is making everyone feel comfortable. Kev says, Bruno just needs to cross them off his to-do list once in a while. Right? The thoughts. Thoughts and prayers, Bruno. Let me know your thoughts and prayers down below as well in the comment section. Subscribe, thumb up the video. And until next time, don't forget to never give up on luxurious, fashionable love. Bye.